In 1993, a movie called Fire in the Sky was released, telling the story of Travis Walton, a logger in Arizona, who was supposedly abducted by aliens in 1975. The movie is actually very good, very entertaining, a very good popcorn flick, but it is only based loosely on the true events, taking liberties here and there and adding to the story. Today I will be telling you the true events of what actually happened on that fateful night in 1975 to Travis Walton. It was November the 5th, 1975. Travis Walton and six other loggers were working in the thick brush of the Arizona forests. The sun was setting as their workday came to an end. They all packed up their gear and piled into the small truck and headed back to civilization. As they made their way down the rough bumpy dirt roads, they noticed a strange light emanating from a thick growth of pine forest. Their first thought was that it may be a forest fire and decided to investigate. They made their way through a break in the trees and came to the source of the strange light. There was no denying what the seven men were looking at. A massive disc-like object floating above the trees, close enough to see in detail. Travis had a fleeting thought that the ship was going to disappear and without really thinking, he threw the truck door open and ran towards the craft. His six companions pleaded with him to return to the truck, but Travis just made his way closer. As Travis got nearer to the craft, his nerves got the better of him, and he started to approach more slowly. The craft made a loud, powerful sound, which worried the men more. They once again pleaded with Travis to return to the truck. But Travis's curiosity got the better of him, and he continued to proceed. Travis would later go on to describe that as he looked up at the ship, there was a bright light, but not bright enough to blind. He could still make out details of the ship, describing it as a glass-like substance which reflected all of its surroundings. Travis then went on to describe an electrical discharge feeling coming from the ship. The ship then began to vibrate and wobble furiously, and Travis felt the need to dive to the ground. His friends, now frantic, screamed at him to get back in the truck. Travis found his nerves and got back to his feet, but before he could take a step, he was struck by what he describes as a strong blast of energy. As this energy from the craft hit his body, it threw him 20 feet through the air sending him down onto the hard floor in a crumpled mess. At this point, the men in the truck fled. They thought for certain that Travis, their friend, was dead. They drove away at speed, concerned that the craft may be following them. After they got further down the road, and their nerves calmed a little, they became overcome with guilt and decided to turn round and try and help Travis, or at least retrieve his dead body. They arrived back just in time to see the UFO disappear into the clouds above the trees. Travis was nowhere to be seen. The six men later reported Travis missing at the Sheriff's Department. A massive manhunt was launched to find Travis. This included 60 volunteers, helicopters, planes and tracking dogs. But nothing was found. Travis's six friends quickly became the main suspects in the case, with many believing that the six men had accidentally killed Travis and was trying to cover it up with a fantastical story. They all volunteered to take a lie detector test and all passed with flying colours. But still, the claims that Travis had been abducted by a flying saucer was still hard to swallow. So whether you believe or not, here is Travis's description of what happened next on board the UFO. As the manhunt was going on back down on Earth, Travis awoke in a very humid, warm room, lying down on a table. His vision was blurry and he had an intense pain in his chest and head. He could make out three figures in the room standing above him. He had no problem remembering the incidents and presumed he was in a hospital surrounded by doctors. But as his vision came back to him, he quickly discovered this wasn't the case. The three figures standing above him were not human at all. Their features seemed underdeveloped somehow. Their skin looked soft and they wore an all-in-one jumpsuit. Travis tried to move but the pain in his body was too much. Also, he felt like gravity had been turned up a notch, and his limbs felt heavy. One of the creatures moved closer to Travis, bringing his face down closer to his, and he lashed out with his heavy arm, barely touching the creature, but succeeded to knock him back into his companion. Travis then found the strength to get up off the table and grab the nearest object, which was lying on a shelf behind him. 
He tried in vain to break the object, so he could have a sharp edge to keep the creatures at bay. But failing to do so, he continued to swing the object around, in a threatening manner. Travis recalls the creatures standing just far enough away to avoid contact, and then they outstretched their arms and seemed to beckon him to calm down. As Travis calmed down and lowered the object, the creatures stood there, staring at him intently, which Travis described as very unnerving and uncomfortable. Travis later went on to say that maybe the aliens were trying to place some kind of mind control upon him, but it didn't seem to be working, and with this, they turned and left the room to the right. Travis stood there alone, in the hot, sterile room. After a few minutes, he decided to make a break for it. He ran out of the door, turning left. He made his way down a long, narrow corridor. He felt suffocated, and the heat was unbearable. Eventually, after walking about maybe 10 or 20 feet, he came to an opening of another room and walked inside. Inside the room, he describes a few sealed doorways on the opposite wall. Travis made his way over to the doors and proceeded to try and open it, but failing to do so, he turned round and inspected the room. In the middle of the room sat a single high back chair, its back facing Travis. First he was too nervous to go near the chair in case someone was sat in it, but as he moved slowly round the chair to get a better view, he could see that the chair was in fact empty, and proceeded over to it. He realised as he moved closer to the chair, the room became more transparent-like, and the walls seemed to display an ocean of stars, not unlike a planetarium. Travis noticed a control panel on the chair, which held quite a few featureless buttons. Travis pressed a few but nothing seemed to happen. Travis noticed a lever on the chair and decided to pull it. As he did so, the entire room of stars seemed to shift around him and spin, making Travis lose his balance as he was already very disorientated from after waking up on the table. All of a sudden, Travis's attention was drawn to the entrance of the room. There stood a man who seemed to look very much human, although he did wear a big glass helmet. Travis ran up to the man in a panic bombarding him with questions, but the man did not answer, and only prompted Travis to follow him out of the room. He did so, and as they walked the long, narrow corridors, he asked more questions, but got no answers. They eventually walked through a doorway that led to a massive room. The room was a lot cooler, and seemed to have artificial light that felt a lot like sunlight. They made their way down a steep ramp that Travis was sure he was going to fall down, but the surface seemed to hold him in place. As the strange man rushed Travis through the room, Travis had a good look around and thought it resembled some kind of aircraft carrier, as it had many stationary crafts placed here and there. Travis was then led through another hallway, which led to a room where more humanoid people were waiting for him. Although these ones were not wearing helmets, Travis tried again in vain to ask questions, but once again, none of them replied. They just stared back blankly, and suggested with their hands that he sit down on the table in the middle of the room. Travis refused and started to fight back, but due to the pain and discomfort he was feeling, he was inevitably forced to lie down. They placed what Travis thought looked like an oxygen mask onto his face. He tried in vain to grab the mask off, but before he could do so, Travis lost consciousness. The next thing Travis remembered was regaining consciousness face down on the hard cold road. A bright light seemed to shine from behind him, and as he turned round to have a look, the light went out and he could see the spacecraft hovering above him, the road reflecting off its surface. And without warning, and without sound, it flew straight up into the clouds and disappeared. And Travis was left, all alone, in the dark, on the side of the road. Travis made his way to the nearest town, and came across some phone booths. He rang the operator, who connected him to his brother-in-law, who at first thought it was a prank call. He quickly realised it wasn't, and quickly drove out to collect Travis. On the way on that night, Travis was informed how worried everyone had been about him after being gone for days. Travis couldn't understand what was being told to him. From his perspective, he'd only been gone a few hours, when in fact, Travis had actually been gone for five whole days. Upon Travis's return, he went through many drug tests and polygraph tests. He passed all of them. The fact that Travis and all his work associates also passed is what some believe is all the proof that they need 
that this is a genuine case of alien abduction. If that's not enough proof, here are a few more things that may persuade you this was real. Years later when Travis returned to the exact scene of the abduction, Travis's crew boss noticed the trees where the UFO had appeared seemed to be growing faster than all the ones around them. After getting 9 core samples, he discovered the trees grew at a very slow rate from 1918 up until 1992, the date that the abduction took place. This suggested that the trees were growing faster due to the appearance of the UFO. Another interesting point made takes us back to the night when Travis bolted from the truck to get a closer look at the craft. His friend, Ken Peterson, was sitting next to him and he quickly leaned over to shut the door behind him, briefly exposing his arm to the light coming from the ship. He was later diagnosed with skin cancer on the very same arm. Another theory by Travis is when the energy beam from the ship threw him 20 feet in the air and crumpled his body on the floor, that the aliens had unintentionally killed him and took him back upon their ship to somehow bring him back to life with means unknown to us, and the aliens were only trying to heal rather than intimidate or harm. As I said before, the movie Fire in the Sky seemed to make up and highly dramatise the actual event as Hollywood movies tend to do. Travis was not happy with the outcome of the movie as it was not an accurate retelling of the story. Travis has since turned down large sums of money from film industries stating the only version of the story he wants to tell is the true one. So as always, what do you think? Was the Travis UFO incident a huge hoax? Or was it true? I'll let you decide. I'll see you next time.